Thank you very much. Um, took an inspiration from uh, the previous speaker and mentioned conflicts of interest. I do have conflicts of interest. Um, uh, a publicly traded company, I have options in the company. And I'll also mention, um, I'll be making some forward-looking statements as a public company, so it has risks and uncertainties, and uh, please, uh, uh, investors should uh, review our filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission for more detailed information about our company. So <clears throat> there is a theme uh, we heard in, in part this morning, um, you know, sort of a, a thread uh, through, the, through time um, in aging research. And in part, it's been, it was inspired by work done well over 100 years ago now, uh, recognizing basic cell biology. You know, the birds and the bees were made from a lineage of cells that have no dead ancestors. It's really an amazing thing when one thinks about it. The germline, the, the lineage of cells that continually makes new babies that are born young, uh, obviously haven't aged because they've uh, been uh, proliferating uh, for billions of years, changing, evolving, uh, but nevertheless, uh, we are their uh, offspring, but we will only live a few decades. And that dichotomy uh, between the mortality of somatic cells, which are really you and me, right, and the immortality of the germline. And by the way, it's, it's, I know there's always the person out there who says, no, come on, Mike. I mean, there's meiosis. You're ignoring, you know, sexual reproduction and all that. Well, I'll just, I'm not here to defend all this, these basic premises that we're operating under here, but remember, there are parthenogenetic um, animals, even vertebrate animals, that have no meiosis, you know, they're, they're all clones. And uh, so, you know, we know that uh, you age, I would argue, we know that aging is a uniquely somatic cell, differentiated, related phenomenon. And so by comparing the two, we could potentially learn something very important about aging, is my point. A lot of this work, a lot of this philosophy goes back to August Weissman, of course. And I, I want you to look again at this quote that's been mentioned numerous times in the literature in his uh, um, essays on the duration of life. He said, death takes place because a worn out tissue uh, cannot forever renew itself and, there's an and there, uh, capacity by means of uh, cell division is not everlasting but finite. The last part is the prediction that somatic cells have a finite replicative capacity, which of course was only really pinned down in the 1960s with uh, Dr. Hayflick's observations. But you notice he talks about uh, tissues renewing themselves as well. What I'm going to suggest uh, here this morning is, is that really critical to the biology of aging is not just the repression of immortality through the repression of telomerase in the case of uh, human biology, but the repression of the ability of tissues to um, regenerate. Okay, so I'm gonna walk you through that. So if we take the Weissman barrier, this dichotomy of immortal life versus mortal life, uh, as a, it, combining those two concepts, replicative immortality and the ability to regenerate, we can come up with a little diagram like this. So primitive, uh, unicellular animals, of course, like tetrahymena, proliferate without limit, and in a sense can regenerate in that sense. And as we move up into multicellular animals, <clears throat> animals like hydra, planaria, planaria, as was said by an early researcher, are immortal under the edge of the knife. And they just keep regrowing things and keep proliferating, and they don't age. In the case of, if we move up to humans, uh, the barrier really should be, I think, set at about eight weeks of development after the body's formed during organogenesis and embryogenesis. Um, the ability to regenerate gets shut off. And many of you are familiar with this, I think, in the literature. It, I think it was best studied in marsupials where the um, typically mammals, uh, the embryo uh, crawls into the pouch is easily accessible for experimental studies prior to this embryonic fetal transition. And you can actually time and study the fact that skin will scarlessly heal within, you know, like 72 hours 
uh, up to the point of the embryonic fetal transition, the equivalent in the case of the marsupial, uh, and then thereafter you get fibrosis, which was, has been talked about in the case of pulmonary fibrosis by uh, Dr. Blasco and so on. So we think of fibrosis sort of a failed regenerative response, but that switch is occurring very early, as is telomerase. But anyway, both are turned off, is my point, at the Weissman barrier. About eight weeks in the case of humans, about 18 days uh, in the case of mouse. So um, you guys probably know that study biology of aging. Some animals don't age. The, the hydra is an example I'm showing you here from the literature. There's no Goppert's curve. There's no programmed aging. They are a very primitive organism, to be sure. Uh, so. Is it possible to take lessons from the immortality of the germline and transfer that biology into the soma? That's the theme of what I'm going to talk about today. Well, the first uh, idea, of course, was you know, telomerase uh, work and you know, cloning telomerase and seeing whether telomerase could be transferred into somatic cell lineages, as Dr. Blasco has described. Uh, another idea was, well, you know, maybe we could capture the germline in the dish. Uh, so the search for embryonic stem cells and embryonic germ cells, which are a somewhat downstream, uh, you know, circulating progenitor to sperm and egg, um, both those cells were isolated uh, in the late 1990s, and they're, you know, sperm and egg don't proliferate, so you can't really you get a culture of them growing. But there are these intermediates of the, in the human germline, uh, embryonic stem cells, embryonic germ cells, that do proliferate, and uh, they can be captured in the laboratory dish. And so for the first time in the history of medicine, we had captured, well, the human germline. Really pretty cool, you know, cells that don't age, just like the species doesn't age. Now, like, I, I, somewhat prosaic application of this, but nevertheless, I think important, and I've spent a lot of my last decades working on, is can we use this platform as a means of manufacturing replacement young cells of all kinds, because these are, these cells make everything in the body, and so could we use them as a way of manufacturing uh, cell-based therapeutics, replacement parts you know, for the, for the human body. So they come, in the case of embryonic stem cells, they come from the inner cell mass of the blastocyst. There's a nice little colony there of the, of the cells, uh, one of the early uh, cell lines. And what, what we're doing at Ajax is we, we've combined this with um, a genetic modification. Uh, HLAG is a uh, type of a, a transplant rejection antigen, you know, the HLA antigens that confers relatively uh, uh, an immunosuppressive phenotype in the pregnancy, prevents the mother from attacking a pregnancy. So we've engineered HLAG into master cell banks, uh, or we are engineering it into master cell banks of human ES cells and using uh, those cells to make uh, young cells of various kinds. And we'll just quickly show you uh, a, a few aspects of that. Um, one additional uh, invention that we bring to uh, the manufacture of these products is what we call pure stem. All this is is the clonal expansion of primitive embryonic onlog into various tissues of the body. So early in development in the embryonic pre-fetal, before you cross the Weissman barrier, uh, the cells generally have already turned off telomerase so that they're mortal, but they have long telomeres but they're all, generally all very proliferative, and so you can expand cells clonally from one cell and make a cell line that has enormous replicative capacity. And that's what pure stem is, and we've generated lots of these. One uh, cell type that uh, caught our uh, attention is the brown adipose cell. Some of you are familiar with brown adipose tissue. This is published data, not ours showing the age-related loss of brown adipose tissue. What is this tissue and why is it important? Uh, it's sort of anti-fat. It, um, um, it, it rivals the brain for its uptake of glucose. 
and it burns it to generate heat. It's, it's thought to be a thermogenic organ. It's the basis of non-shivering thermogenesis, especially in young people. But look how precipitously it's lost with age. Experiments in animals suggest that this loss with age is throwing metabolism off balance and may be important contributor to obesity and uh, type 2 diabetes in, in the aged population. Well, we found that we can manufacture using pluripotent cells and this pure stem technology in particular, we can make progenitors that make brown fat uh, cells. On the left is um, uh, fetal, uh, der fetal derived brown fat cultures. And you can see in red stained a marker for the brown fat cell. And you can see a minority of the cells are stained, but using uh, pluripotent stem cell master cell banks and this pure stem thing, we can get 100% pure um, populations of these cells that are very potent and have all the important markers of brown fat. So, you know, we're targeting this product for uh, type 2 diabetes, which is obviously uh, a very significant unmet need in medicine. Another cell type we're interested in making are young vascular progenitors. Vascular aging is very important, uh, and we can make these cells, you know, as close to 100% pure as we can determine by flow cytometry using the same technology I described for the brown fat, and of course, cardiovascular diseases. Ischemic diseases and aging are uh, another very large uh, unmet need in medicine, which we're attempting to uh, address with these products. Now I want to switch to the thing I'm most excited about, and I, I'm, I'm hoping that in future years these meetings continue. I want to thank, by the way, the organizers for a very interesting meeting. And I'm hoping that in coming decades um, the technology I'm about to describe become um, more mainstream and have greater applicability in aging research and in medicine. So 1997, uh, I uh, noticed the cloning of Dolly the sheep. And um, I, I, I walked away from my first biotech company, Geron, because I, I saw some data. There was a laboratory in Massachusetts that had cloned uh, an animal from senescent cells. And the cloned uh, animal, the peta, fetus actually, it had, it, when you took cells from it, it had the same proliferative capacity as cells that the original animal had. And I thought, holy cow, holy cow, bad, bad pun, and uh, holy cow. And I thought, nuclear transfer could actually reset telomeres. You know, that, we, I think I've got a slide in here to show you. Yeah, here we go. So we actually showed this. So these animals were all cloned from senescent cow cells in vitro, very carefully characterized. I won't walk you through all the data here, but the, the two uh, growth curves there represent the original culture of uh, fetal fibroblasts from fetal cows, and then the clones from those uh, grown to, again, to the fetal stage and cells cultured and looking at the replica of the lifespan of the resulting clones. And so we actually, uh, the um, as Maria Belasco mentioned, you know, it's possible sometimes to grow the telomeres longer than they were originally when you're dealing with the immortal germline. And we saw these clones made, uh, they were younger than young in terms of telomere length. But it, for sure, you know, it could reset telomere length and it was obviously reversing development, right? Uh, these were um, skin fibroblasts, right? Um, almost all you know, somatic cell nuclear transfer means you're taking a somatic cell and it's going all the way back to the beginning of life. So we saw the egg cell as sort of a cellular time machine. You know, wow, amazing. How does that work? And so as you, as you know, that's evolved in the current day to what's commonly called induced pluripotency. There's various versions of this, quite a few versions of this. Um, but on the left you can see <clears throat> these are all isogenic on the left is a telomere blot. These are all isogenic. So there's H9, one of the original ES cell lines. You can see the relatively long telomeres, TRF lengths. And then EN13 is a pure stem clone uh, grown out towards senescence. 
uh, and you see the telomere shortening in that clone. We took that cell then and uh, reprogrammed it uh, with KOSM, uh, all, uh, and you can see over time how it re restored back a little bit higher than the telomere length uh, that the original cell had. All this being isogenic, so it convinced us that telomere extension was really possible um, in induced pluripotency where you have defined factors. The, um, a, a little diagram below that just shows the extension of cell lifespan correlated with the increase in telomere length. In more recent years, Steve Horvath, you know, who's developed this epigenetic clock, uh, has shown that uh, you can see his uh, methylome age on the, on the right there, and you can see uh, ES cells, of course, are at the beginning of life. Somatic cells show evidence of this uh, clock ticking away, uh, epigenetic clock, and you can see how it's reset in induced pluripotency. So by all criteria that I'm aware of, uh, you know, reprogramming, can restore a cell all the way back to the beginning of life. It really does appear to reverse um, multiple important markers of aging. Is it possible to do this in vivo? Yeah, that's the million dollar question. And when I think about this, I, I uh, think about all the complexity of aging, and all the things, all the diverse theories of aging, some of which I'm showing you here. But could it really be that simple uh, as epigenetic reprogramming? I would point out that, you know, in the years past, uh, the gerontological community was absolutely convinced that we would never understand the aging, the in vitro aging of cells, the Hayflick phenomenon. Um, it was, there were, you know, lectures in the past, incredibly complex, hundreds of uh, documented changes in senescent cells. This is entropy at work. We'll never understand it. We'll never intervene in it. Certainly we could never, you know, make a cell immortal. Well, one gene, the catalytic component of telomerase, was sufficient. Is this, it could, could aging in vivo be more simple than potentially that we think? Could a lot of these other changes be epiphenomenon of aging? Uh, I don't have the answer, but I'm going to lay out some reasons to believe that it may be more simple than we would, um, the skeptical mind would uh, think or conclude. So to me, uh, the aging of the soma, is, it's not one step. It's not just the repression of telomerase. Telomerase is, a, a, I'm showing you step one there, and what we're calling somatic restriction. So this is like a somatic restriction theory of aging. It's saying that during the development of the soma, as Weissman predicted, there are changes that are occurring that are committing the soma to mortality. And you remember he said two things, a repression of re immortal replicative capacity and the inability to repair or regenerate a tissue. Telomerase is turning off, but there's a second step there. At the embryonic fetal transition, there's, as I mentioned, a repression of regeneration. It's multi-organ. It involves the majority, uh, you know, the three germ layers. It's a majority of tissues in the body. Uh, the brain loses the ability to regenerate. The heart continues the ability to regenerate all the way up to the time you're born, uh, humans and mice, uh, to at least to some extent. Uh, but then it's within the first week after you're born, that's turned off. That's the neonatal transition. So there's multiple transitions that are occurring, but they're developmentally programmed. And I guess my point is, Having pluripotent, pluripotent cells and, of course, easily getting these adult counterparts to all these cells, we have an in vitro model that encompasses both sides of the Weissman barrier. So using molecular techniques, we can really delve into the biology and figure out what's going on. So we've been looking at these different transitions. I'm just going to quickly show you some examples. So here's telomerase by RNA sequencing. On the left, you can see embryonic stem cells and induced pluripotent cells. And then this, the majority of the samples in the middle are all from the upper arm skin fibroblasts, cultured early passage in vitro. So at eight weeks, uh, it's hard to time, you know, a, a 
of abortions, but at eight weeks you're presuming you're right before the transition. But you can see by then, the telomerase is already turned off. In our hands, telomerase turns off weeks into development. I mean, the first couple weeks into development in most tissues. So it's off throughout our lifespan, right? And then at the far right, you can see you can turn it back on, of course, using in, in, in induced pluripotency. Um, now here's an example of a marker that coincides with a downstream event, the embryonic fetal transition. This is COX-7A1. It's a protein that is involved in forming dimers in complex four of OxFos uh, complexes. And it's kind of hard to see in this graph, but <clears throat> the embryonic stem cells are uh, averaged on the, on the far left. Then are about 100 of these pure stem, diverse pure stem um, embryonic progenitors. That's actually zero signal. That's background signal on a uh, microarray. But then by the time you get to eight weeks, can you see signal in COX-71 begins to increase throughout development? Uh, and then after the um, reaching um, reproductive maturity sort of levels off, you can restore it back to the beginning, uh, as you predict perhaps, uh, with induced pluripotency. Um, and uh, a similar developmental timing occurs in the mouse, showing on the right. So there are, uh, there are I wouldn't have time today for a short talk, but there are dozens of really interesting markers, uh, gene expression changes that are profoundly changing at the embryonic fetal transition globally throughout tissues in the body. And we think this, of course, could be linked to the Warburg effect, the shift toward oxidative phosphorylation. Indeed, um, COX-71, like telomerase, uh, goes back to an embryonic mode uh, in the majority, about 90% of cancers, just like telomerase turns on, about 90% of cancers, and may participate in this Warburg shift we talk about, the, in cancer, the shift back toward glycolysis. So um, how do we, how do I try to um, lay out a, an image? I'm kind of visually oriented, you know. So this is the Waddington epigenetic landscape. Uh, Waddington is credited for this idea of epigenetics. And we modified it just a little bit, of course. And uh, so the idea is, underneath it, he thought there were genes, and genes were um, having, uh, there were epigenetic uh, factors that influence the developmental landscape and so cells during development were you know rolling down this landscape based on epigenetic effects which were based on genes now so I put on the on the left here these various transitions there's the pluripotency transition where uh, immortal the immortal germline commits to the somatic cells so it's leaving the immortality of the germline and leaving the regenerative potential that it once had and um, committing first through the embryonic fetal transition once development is complete and then the neonatal transition when you're born and then the adult transition when you've leveled off in your growth curve. Induced pluripotency on the right of course takes cells all the way back to immortality and back to pluripotency. The goal is induced tissue regeneration or uh, when combined with telomerase, immortal tissue regeneration, is it possible to de develop a technology to take cells on a ride, not back to day one, you know, back before the embryonic fetal transition to restore <clears throat> um, regenerative potential and to carry telomerase along because you know, telomerase, you have to go all the way back to the beginning to turn it on. So how do you do this? So this is our concept. So first I'll mention on the far right, we've been screening small molecules to see if they can have this effect. There's small molecules that are thought to, modu uh, to be able to induce pluripotency. We've been working on those. That's a, a cocktail we call ITR 1547. Another strategy is to take uh, pluripotent cells that grow easily and can be easily genetically engineered. We have such a line, it's called Recite 1. And um, we've been working on exosomes, extracellular vesicles to transport signals uh, throughout the body. And so uh, our um, concept here is to make 
a deliverable technology to deliver reprogramming factors uh, back, it uh, takes cells back in time. We believe, here is a, uh, a LOVA et al. Uh, published a timeline of reprogramming and published the data. And if you can, you know, look at your favorite gene of interest, you can see COX-71 drop off very early. So evidence that you can take cells back before the embryonic fetal transition, way before you've taken the cells all the way back to pluripotency. So we believe this is, you know, this is possible. As evidence that some of this can work, uh, this is our small molecule uh, result. You can see uh, that we can take, um, using this one marker, uh, COX-71, we can take cells back to the uh, embryonic fetal transition. So I guess in summary, my thought is, uh, is to you know, share the idea that a lot of these changes in aging are what we think may be occurring very early, like repression of telomerase and the repression regeneration and the downstream effects uh, as predicted by the model of antagonistic, antagonistic pleiotropy may be that they may have effects in aging. Um, making universally graftable pluripotent young cells to sort of a bread and butter approach to treating specific degenerative diseases of aging. And uh, the transient expression of telomerase and reprogramming factors may be an important way of uh, even in vivo of, of reversing uh, various aspects of aging for, to uh, increase regeneration for age-related uh, degenerative disease. A, a quote to remember, the opening uh, sentence in, uh, uh, in Gauss's book on regeneration, if there's no regeneration, there wouldn't be any life. But if everything regenerated, there would be no death. Something to contemplate. Thank you very much.